Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I have the high honor and the distinct privilege and the great pleasure and joy to read in your hearing from the Word of God, Hosea chapter 13. When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of the chimney. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. Therefore I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard. By the way will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, and will rend the call of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion and wild beast shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? And thy judges, of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hid. The sorrows of a tra travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women and child shall be ripped up. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to read your pure, unadulterated, and holy word. 
have to find a deep lodging place in all of our hearts and minds, souls, and spirits. Help us to be warned that you uh, do not want us to forget you because of the blessings you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, I believe that anybody uh, who has any uh, spiritual connection to you can see that we have done that in America just as the Israelites have done. And Holy Father God, all we can pray is have mercy and grace upon such wretched people as we are in your church today and in this country. And for Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive us of all of our sins. And Lord, help us to truly humble ourselves and to pray and to seek your face and to turn from our wicked ways and to repent and get back to you, our first love, by your grace, by your strength, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that millions would come to know your Savior and millions of Christians would, in the words of uh, Jonathan Kahn, return to you. In Jesus Christ's name I do pray and forsake. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, as we continue this suite of Bible reading, devotional material, we move on to the scripture and the sense. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is Daniel White, the third president of Gospel Light Society International with the Scripture and uh, the Sense podcast, episode number 640. where I simply read the Word of God and give the sense of it based on an authoritative commentary source such as the Bible Knowledge Commentary and or the Matthew Henry Commentary or some other reputable commentary or study Bible. Beloved, this podcast is based upon Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 8 in the Word of God where it says Ezra and the Levites read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading as they were seeking revival in the nation. They started with the Word of God. So therefore, the aim of this podcast is that through the simple reading of the Word of God and uh, the giving of the sense of it, the church would be revived. And uh, that is my prayer that the church would be revived and that the world would be awakened and saved from the wrath of God to come and from the eternal burning hell by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as he was the first and best in preaching the gospel 
when he said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Dear friend, before we go any further, if you have never believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, simply put your faith in him. Believe that he died for your sins, was buried and rose on the third day, and do what he told you to do in that powerful verse, the most beautiful words ever spoken on this earth. He said, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So believe in Christ. Pray and ask him to save your soul, and he will do so. Today, beloved, we are starting a new chapter. We are reading Nahum chapter 2, verse 1. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us your strength, your unction, and your anointing, and the power of your Holy Spirit to read your holy word and to get the sense of it. Uh, so that we can apply it to our lives, so that we can obey the principles, so that we can share your holy word with others, for they need it just as well as we do, and so that we can share your holy gospel and preach your holy gospel based upon your holy scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Nahum chapter 2 verse 1 He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face keep the munition watch the way make thy loins strong make thy loins strong fortify thy power mightily and dear friends, I just read in your hearing Nahum chapter 2, verse 1. Now here is the sense of it devotionally, if you will, from the Matthew Henry commentary. Nineveh shall not put aside this judgment. There is no counsel or strength against the Lord. God looks upon proud cities and brings them down as God looks upon proud people, and he brings them down. Particular account is given of the terrors wherein the invading enemy shall appear against Nineveh. The empire of Assyria is represented as a queen about to be led captive to Babylon. Guilt in the conscience fills men with terror in an evil day. And what will treasures or glory do for us in times of distress or in the day of wrath? Yet for such things, how many lose their souls? That's Matthew Henry. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary of Dallas Theological Seminary for more background information and uh, historical information. Chapter 1 includes more or less general statements about the Lord's judgment on his enemy. But now the book moves to more specific descriptions of the attack and plundering of the city. Nineveh would be attacked, defeated, and plundered. But Judah's glory will be restored. Associated with this change in emphasis is a shift in tone from calmness and dignity to increasing emotion and vivid descriptions. Concerning some of these tense graphic descriptions of action in battle, 
Raymond Calkins wrote, Nahum portrays the siege, reproduces its horrors and its savagery, its cruelties and mercilessness in language so realistic that one is able to see it and feel it. First comes the fighting in the suburbs, then the assault upon the walls, then the capture of the city and its destruction. Under attack, Nineveh was called on to defend itself. In an alternating pattern, Nahum had addressed Nineveh in chapter 1, verse 11 and 14, and now in chapter 2, verse 1, he had addressed Judah in chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 15. The advance of an unnamed attacker against Nineveh was so certain that Nahum spoke of it in the present tense. The verb advances is literally goes up, a word used of hostile military operations. The attacker was Nabopolassar, the Babylonian, who with Cyaxerus the Mede conquered Nineveh. Then a series of four terse commands follows. They reflect the Ninevites' scurry of activity to defend their great city. In bitter irony, a subtle form of ridicule Nahum urged the city to prepare for the approaching siege by guarding the fortress, watching the road for invaders, bracing themselves and marshalling all their strength. The prophet knew that such precautions could not hold back the siege or change its outcome. All Nineveh's efforts to defend itself would be futile because, as God said, the city would be destroyed. And when God, when God says something, that is exactly what's going to happen. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you so much for our time together uh, with the scripture and the sense. Lord, uh, help us to take heed to your holy word, uh, apply it to our lives, the principles thereof, and Lord, help us to obey your Holy Ghost and help us to be obedient to you and be what you would have us to be in these last and evil days. And help us to share your holy word freely and openly. And help us to proclaim your holy gospel for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, this is Daniel White, the third president of Gospel Light Society International with the White House family devotional reading of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's magnificent devotional work and book titled Morning and Evening. 
This is the podcast, and this is episode number 250. Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, still today, chose for our reading 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And Dr. Spurgeon goes on to say, Peter most earnestly exhorted the scattered saints to love each other with a pure heart fervently, and he wisely fetched his argument, not from the law, from nature, or from philosophy, but from that high and divine nature which God hath implanted in his people, just as some judicious tutor of princes might labor to beget and foster in them a kingly spirit and dignified behavior, finding arguments in their position and descent. So looking upon God's people as heirs of glory, princes of the blood royal, descendants of the king of kings, earth's truest and oldest aristocracy. Peter saith to them, See that ye love one another because of your noble birth, being born of incorruptible seed, because of your pedigree, being descended from God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, and because of your immortal destiny, for you shall never pass away. Wow. Though the glory of the flesh shall fade, and even its existence shall cease, it would be well if in the spirit of humility we recognized the true dignity of our regenerated nature and lived up to it. What is a Christian? If you compare him with a king, he adds priestly sanctity to royal dignity. The king's royalty often lieth only in his crown, but with a Christian, It is infused into his inmost nature. He is as much above his fellows through his new birth as a man is above the beast that perisheth. Surely he ought to carry himself in all his dealings as one who is not of the multitude, but chosen out of the world. Distinguished by sovereign grace, written among the peculiar people, and who therefore cannot grovel in the dust as others, nor live after the manner of the world's citizens. Let the dignity of your nature and the brightness of your prospects, O believers in Christ, constrain you to cleave unto holiness and to avoid the very appearance of evil. Shall we pray? Holy Father God in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for your powerful and holy word. And Lord, thank you for the powerful way that your servant, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, brought it forth to us. Lord, another memorable, amazing devotional. Help us to always remember it. Help us to never forget it. 
Help us to meditate on your holy word and on what was said today. For, Lord, it will change and transform our minds and our lives if we would do it. Help us to do it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him all the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <coughs> Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, a welcome to the standing between the living and the dead service number two, a memorial prayer devotional and evangelistic service all in one. We do a lot in this service. Uh, that's why, pardon me, we had to split the service into two. We just finished uh, part one, and now we're in part two. In keeping with our emphasis on prayer and reading the Bible during this time especially, but all of the time, and having personal uh, devotions and family devotions. Brother Lawrence said, There is no sweeter manner of living in the world than continuous communion with God. And you will probably not have continuous communion with God if you don't start off with God in the morning. If you don't pray to God and read the Bible from God in the morning with whoever is in your household, legitimately. And we're not talking about shacking up situations. God's not going to hear your prayers in that situation. You must first repent of the evil that you're doing in his sight. And always remember, all of our sin is done in his sight. And we primarily sin against him. And he does not like it. And so, with that, may I strongly encourage you, again, have personal devotions. Even if you're married and in the family, before you go to uh, the family devotion, you should have had some kind of devotion yourself. Not only that, once the family has devotions, that's when you go to church. After that, or even on a Sunday morning, Wednesday, you make sure you have family church first, and then you go to the larger church. That's how it's supposed to work. If you're not praying at home and reading the Bible at home and expecting the pastor to raise you from the dead every one, uh, within one hour uh, every day and you're full of sin and evil, 
uh, that's not happening. You might get a little emotional, quick little high. That's going to go poof as soon as you get in the car. But that meaneth nothing. So let's pray. Holy Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, help us to pray for single Christians and for married Christians especially. And then pray for singles who don't know your Savior and uh, families that don't know your Savior. And so, Holy Father God, first and foremost in our lives as Christians, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to pray and help us to seek your face. And help us to turn from our wicked ways and help us to think about what this is. And help us repent and get back to you, our first love. And Holy Father God, in our Christian family life, help us to indeed pray together, but help us also to obey together so that we can stay together. And Holy Father God, we pray for every single person that's lost in every uh, married uh, couple and family, uh, legitimately married, uh, Lord, uh, uh, that they would come to know your Savior. And Holy Father God, we pray that you would open their blinded eyes and stop their deaf ears and save their souls. Have your Holy Ghost and your Holy Word to not give them rest, your Holy Gospel not to give them rest until they come to know you. And Holy Father God, forgive us of our sins as Christians who have disobeyed your great commandment and your great commission. And for Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us of our sins and help us to repent. And, uh, Lord, to be the shining lights and witnesses that you would have us to be. Lord, help us to even hear, to pass out gospel tracts today. And we pray that you bless and anoint those words and bless and anoint those pamphlets to open blinded eyes and unstop deaf ears that others may come to know you as Savior. And Holy Father God, we pray that you would raise up laborers. Lord, if we refuse to be used by you, raise up others, uh, laborers, into the whited harvest field to reap the harvest for your glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ to Jesus Let's recite or read the New Apostles' Creed. Do not say this if you don't believe this. If you're not a born-again Christian, this will not mean anything to you. So don't just say things that you don't mean. Uh, however, if you are a born-again Christian, uh and you recite this and read this, it ought to mean something to you, and it ought to transform your life and your mindset, even this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He was seen alive by Mary Magdalene and the other women, the disciples and over 500 other brethren. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, 
Let's go back to the family verses as we are dissecting uh, the, this passage uh, using the wisdom uh, and uh, the knowledge of Dr. John R. Rice to help explain this passage from a biblical standpoint. Uh, and today, as we've already dealt with the wives uh, thoroughly, we're now dealing with the husbands thoroughly. Verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. As we pick up from where we left off yesterday with Dr. John R. Rice, uh, former editor, founder of the Sword of the Lord and evangelist extraordinaire, said in 1 Peter 3, 7, the husband is exhorted to treat the wife with that kindness and honor Christians should show to weaker ones. Notice the words, likewise, ye husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge, that is, by the way, biblical knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, your wife is a part of yourself. You are one. So love her as you love your own body. Love her with the unselfish compassion that Christ has for his church. Husbands, do you really love your wife? Do you really want the best for her? The very best? Well, then, true love is going to uh, encourage her when she does well. And true love is going to rebuke her when she does wrong. You don't love your wife. Wife, have her way and do what she wants to do when it's contrary to the word of God. That is not love. Open rebuke is better than secret love all day long. And I know you think that she's going to hate you for telling her the truth. But if you truly love her and you want her to be uh, what she should be, and, uh, and, 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 and you want both of you to be one as you should be, you cannot have rebelliousness and disobedience, disrespect and stubbornness in that oneness. That has to be dealt with. <coughs> uh, pardon me. Now, the Lord can and will deal with it, but he would rather for you to deal with it. He's delegated that to you. And I have to bring this up because uh, most women today are out of control. Prideful, stubborn, 
rebellious, practicing witchcraft in their home, lying, dishonesty, causing confusion and convolution, no accountability, no respect. This is the reason why we're in this plague, because the home in the church is flat out of control because of false preaching and false writing of books that people have read that have made traditions instead of focus on the Word of God. I find it very interesting that two women who have ascended to the heights uh, in connection to the Supreme Court and law. These are women who were raised in environments where they were taught to respect their husband and to submit to their husband and to obey their husband. But yet they, on the liberal side and on the conservative side, are BG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and now Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett will become the next Supreme Court justice. Both of them were raised in religions and in faiths that taught them to be a lady as RBG's uh, mother taught her before she died. She told her, Ruth, be always be a lady. You don't have to... Uh, uh, try to be a man always be a lady and she said what I mean by that is do away with all useless emotions that don't get you anywhere such as anger and bitterness and resentment so while our BG did the great work she did for women in civil rights and, and of course we don't agree with everything she uh, did uh, we would dissent from what she even what she, what she did but anyway uh, on, some, on some things but she did not do it in an arrogant proud ferocious disrespectful manner she did it in a ladylike manner, with a meek and quiet voice, but she was oh so very powerful. And now here comes Amy Coney Barrett, raised in a Christian church community where they emphasize the wife submitting to her husband and obeying her husband even down to voting. You know, and, and yet there are some who are trying to make a big deal about that, but, you know, it's not going to work. But I just want you to understand how God will raise you up if you follow his principles. You don't have to do it the world's way. And I'm saying this to all women. Be ladylike. Your husband will love you tremendously. And uh, yes, you ought to anyway. But uh, he will love being around you. If you have a ladylike spirit, a submissive spirit, a cheerful spirit, and you, you, you're you, willing to submit and to obey. I know you don't like it, but it's true. That standard, husbands, is so high that it should make 
every one of us very humble as we try to be good husbands. If the man is stronger, he should be better. If the man, uh, not better than the woman, but uh, uh, this is what Dr. John R. Rice is saying, uh, he ought to be able to do some things that she can't do. The man has more authority. He should have more responsibility. That's a given. You see, husbands, you can't enjoy the perks of leadership of the home where God put you and not be responsible for the home. Yes, your wife is there to help you and to uh, for you to delegate things to. But ultimately, you're responsible for the direction of the home, not the wife. As the salvation of a sinner and the security of his saints depends on Christ, not on us, so the Lord places more heavily on man the responsibility for a happy home. Number one, men can prevent broken homes. The man is to cleave unto his wife. Here the Savior, quoting from Genesis in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Husbands are to have a pure and tender love for their wives and a love that looks over the wife's weakness without bitterness. Without bitterness, as we covered on yesterday, without bitterness. Because this is what breaks up marriages, bitterness. Uh, On the husband's side, and what does he do? He clams up because he's bitter. He does not talk anymore. He does not communicate. Does not want to even be bothered with the woman anymore, the wife anymore. She clams up, bitter, resentful. This is uh, to the point of not touching each other for weeks and months and other such foolishness. That is that is a remedy, uh, not a remedy, but a uh, that is a uh, mixture for divorce. It happens all the time. It's happening even now in this plague pandemic. Husbands should love their wives as special gifts from God. Help meets to make them happy, joyful, cheerful, For whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Proverbs 18.22 Now the Bible talks about uh, the wife who, in Proverbs 14.1, who is a foolish wife who plucketh down her own household. Uh, But in this... uh, Next passage, it talks about a prudent wife is from the Lord. And so we must uh, surmise that a foolish wife who who is constantly trying to pluck down her household comes from the devil. And oftentimes she acts like the devil. And you, if, if somehow you marry that kind of wife, you, you're going to have to deal with that and still love her. Uh, but love her enough to tell her the truth about herself so that you all can stay together. As I have said repeatedly, the family that prays together and obeys together stays together. A husband is to, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs nineteen, fourteen. A husband is to love his wife as the mother of his children, being with him heirs together of the grace of life. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which we covered in another series the other day. 
When a husband loves his wife, even as himself, and as Christ loved the church, is not bitter against her. And that's where many men are today. They are bitter against their wives. And see, bitterness leads to hatred. Hatred leads leads to adultery. And then all of that leads to divorce. Give her honor as the weaker vessel. And leaving father and mother cleaves unto his wife. That home will very rarely be broken. Number two. Evils that follow wrong home life happiness lost faith gone love fails if your home is not right before God be sure your sin will find you out nothing is truer in God's word than whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap Disaster, trouble, heartache, and ruin follow the home where the wife is rebellious and the husband is a slacker. See, uh, he has a whole book on this, uh, on this subject, rebellious wives and slacker husband. That is a remedy. I keep saying remedy. That is a, a mixture for total divorce disaster. Because, see, if you have a rebellious wife, and many of you do, they have you manipulated so much you don't even know it. Uh, But if you can't say what you want to say to your wife without her uh, acting foolishly, then uh, you are a slacker husband and a shirker of your responsibility. See, you can't. Sir, you cannot raise your children in an environment like that. Meaning, you can't teach your children to do right and to show respect and to be obedient. If you got a proud, stubborn, rebellious, witchcraft wife on your hand and she's just running rampant, tearing down everything you're building up in your children, you've got to deal with her in a wise way. And you have to put that down. You have to stop that. Man up and don't be a slacker. And if you mean what you say and you're not just parroting what I say or what some other preacher says or what some book says, and she senses, she senses deep down that you, you, you're coming from your heart and you mean business, she's not going to do it. She's not going to run away and leave permanently. Don't worry about that. You just worry about doing what God told you to do. But you cannot tolerate a rebellious, stubborn witch of a woman in your house. Thinking that you're going to raise your children to be better than that because she's going to try to tear down everything you build up in them. And if you have a wife, you're a pastor, you're a minister, and and you are trying to win souls to Christ in the church and you're trying to help men to do the right thing and your wife is a uh, whorish and a, a flirt you better deal with that because she's going to tear up the devil's going to use her to tear up everything you build up in the church don't be a slacker that's an old fashioned word for being a sorry man a weak man a handpicked man a controlled dominated man In the words of Dr. Tony Evans, a neutered, domesticated man, and I would say even a manipulated man. Some some of you husbands are so mastered by your wives, and they have manipulated you down to nothing. You have no authority. You have no power whatsoever to tell her anything. And the children, if the children see that, then you can't tell them anything. And she certainly can't. But you won't be able to tell them anything either. 
So such a home cannot be biblical and it cannot be happy. There must be something more than temporary sex attraction. And there can be no real peace and happiness until the question of authority is settled. And I might pause here today, but I want you to emphasize that. I want to emphasize that. Let me let me let me share what Dr. Rice uh, said here very clearly. Right there. And there can be no real peace and happiness until the question of authority is settled and settled right. Who is in authority in this family and in this house? Is it your wife? In most cases, that's the case. That's what it is. Is it the children? In some cases, that's what it is. In most cases, the husband is not the final authority. This is why all pastors and almost all pastors and almost all uh, merchants, they cater to the wife and to the children, not to the husband. He is no longer considered the one in authority in the family. That's what's wrong with the church today. And I thank God for Jonathan Kahn. I thank God for Franklin Graham and their meetings they're having this week. The return with Jonathan Kahn. The prayer march with uh, Franklin Graham. But I, I, I have stated this and uh, made this clear. That if we don't deal with our own sins, if we don't, uh, and I made it very clear that praying and marching is not enough. You can't stop there. It's good to start there, but you, you can't stop there. We must humble ourselves. We must pray. We must seek God's face. We must turn from our wicked ways. We must repent and get back to Jesus Christ, our first love, starting in the home. You cannot have a great church and you got hell in the home. You cannot have Adam's family at home and the Brady Bunch family at the church. And the family is slapped out of control because the wife is in charge. She's been built up by lying pastors and, and the children are second in charge. And the husband is in the cave that she made for him in a pink jumper. With no authority, no power. And some like it that way. They like being, being in subjection to their wives because they don't want any responsibilities. They don't want to deal with the problems of raising their children in the way that they should. They are afraid of the attitudes not only of the wife but of the children, especially their daughters. And so they have sunk down to nothing. For a wife to have her own way does not make her happy any more than it does a rebellious child. These are the words of Dr. John R. Rice. Let me say them again. Let me say them again. Because I've been preaching this and telling this the truth for years without the knowledge of what Dr. John R. Rice is saying. He's backing up what I said and I'm backing up what he said. I've said, the, I've said this in a different way for years. For a wife to have her own way and to be in authority over the man and make her happy any more than a rebellious child or a lawless citizen. And I know you don't like it. And see, this is why revival won't come. This is why revival is not going to come. Because you're not willing to repent in your own family. See? He said, well, why are you preaching it if we're not going to do it? Because my job is to preach it, man, woman. I get my blessing and my satisfaction out of doing what God told me to do. I know you don't want to hear this. Not in this day and time. Everybody, everybody in America knows you don't want to hear this. Even in the church, you don't want to hear this. My own wife, who is here helping me in the ministry, does not want to hear this. 
Well, she's here listening to it. See, I don't care whether she likes it or not at all. And so, therefore, I don't care if your wife likes it or not. I love and respect my mother. I don't care if she likes it or not. I have many daughters. I don't care if they like it or not. And I have told them, if you're not willing to be a ladylike, virtuous woman, godly, submissive wife and mother to your husband, don't get married. Don't put that man through that hell and yourself through that hell. Because as Dr. John R. Rice just said, uh, a woman who uh, is, is able to have her way, is allowed to have her way, she's not going to be happy. She's not going to be cheerful and joyful. She's going to be just as miserable as a miserable teenager who is allowed to have his or her way. And everybody under the sound of my voice, you know exactly what I'm saying is true and what Dr. Rice is saying is true. This is, he said, another case where the wages of sin is death. Death to joy, death to happiness, death to peace, and death to all the blessings which God meant should follow marriage and a Christian home. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I have so much more to share with you today but uh, I'm going to I'm going to cut it off at that point remember that maestro technician true happiness and we're going to move on down to prayer move on down to prayer we're going to move on down to prayer move on down to prayer and so ladies and gentlemen first timothy chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 says i exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let's pray for people who name the name of Christ. Let's join in prayer for those who are praying in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's pray for everybody in government. Let's pray for the salvation of every lost soul. Let's pray for the revival of every Christian and let's pray for those people who are hurting because of the thousands of lost loved ones. And let's pray for millions of family members and friends who are hurting over the death of their loved one from the coronavirus plague. Holy Father God in heaven, grant us, Lord, your grace, your strength, your anointing, and the power of your Holy Spirit now to pray. Thank you for your eternal and holy word. And Holy Father God, help us who name the name of Christ to get back to your holy word. Lord, if we're not willing to repent in the family, then uh, revival will not come, and we know it. So, Lord, help us to humble ourselves and help us to pray. Help us to seek your face and help us to turn from our wicked ways. And help us to repent and get back to you, Lord Jesus Christ, our first love. And, Holy Father God, I pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ, revive us again. And, Lord, we pray now for the president and all other government officials. 
uh, Lord, in this country and around the globe. We pray, Lord, for all governors, all mayors, all police chiefs, and all sheriffs and those who work under them. We pray that you would remove uh, the racist bad apples. And, Lord, we pray that you will add good men, red, yellow, black, and white, to your uh, ministers of police officers and sheriffs. We pray for all state senators and all state representatives. We pray, Lord, for uh, President Trump's administration and cabinet. And Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for all other presidents, prime ministers, and potentates and premiers around the world and their countries. And we pray for salvation and spiritual, family and life, protection and provision, financial and material blessings upon all of these people, if they're willing, Lord, and if we're all willing to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways and repent. And, uh, Lord... uh, get right with you and holy father god we pray for the salvation of those who are lost in this country and around the globe and in the media we pray for the revival of the saved in this country around the globe and in the media and we pray holy father god for the healing of the sick and lord uh, we pray for the comforting lord of the grieving And, Lord God in heaven, we pray for all who are being persecuted in this country, in China, uh, in Nigeria, in Sudan, in the Philippines, and all around the world, Christians who are being persecuted. Comfort them as only you can. Bless them and deliver them as only you can. Give them your grace in their trying hours and in their dying hours. God, grant us your grace and your strength and your faith to pray as we should. And Lord, for the grieving family members and friends in the millions around the globe who are hurting today, who uh, their loved one may have died back in May, but they're still hurting today. They still can't believe that that person is not going to come through the door, that that person will never join them for Thanksgiving again, and so forth. And so, Lord, we pray that you will come for them as only you can, Holy Father God, Lord Jesus, for you're the only one who has the power to do that for salvation and for healing. Draw them to your Holy Scriptures for salvation and for healing, and save their souls and change their lives and help them to look to you uh, in the words of the song the uh, songwriter and the songstress uh, Lord help them to look to you and Lord help us all to look to you in a very real sense and we pray for some by name Lord but they represent no doubt over a million people who have died already. And we pray, Lord, for the family and friends of Brazilian indigenous leader Aratana Yaal Lapati. We pray for the family and friends of Florida church member Deborah Henson. We pray for the family and friends of Argentinian Holocaust survivor David Galante. We pray for the family and friends of Mississippi wrestler James Harris. We pray for the families of Texas DJ Bill Mack. We pray for the family and friends of Louisiana Louisiana veteran Steve Wrestler. Uh, and we pray for for the family and friends of California police officer Robbie Wood, for the family and friends of Louisiana Police Administrator 
Sharon Williams. We pray for the family and friends of New Jersey. Columnist Barbara Costigian. And we pray, Lord, for the family and friends of New York Gallery owner James Powers and uh, thousands upon thousands of other uh, family, family members and friends and even millions. Comfort these families as only you can and these friends and strengthen them as only you can. And we pray that you will save their souls and change their lives. Draw them to yourself for salvation. And now, Holy Father God, we pray for Peggy, uh, and we pray for all others who have sent in prayer requests. Hear and answer their prayers, and hear and answer our prayers for them. And, Lord, we pray also for salvation, spiritual, family, and life, financial and material, food and housing and protection and provision blessings for all of the, the, these people and the people who are suffering uh, very badly from this coronavirus plague situation. We pray for Peggy. Please protect David from all ungodly relationships and save Dylan, Andy, Olivia, David, and Sebastian. We pray for Spencer, Marco, and uh, Riven as well. And Lord, we pray for Vicky. Please heal her body completely. Bless her brother Bill in a supernatural way. We pray for James. Please bless him with Bibles for the new converts. We pray for Patrick, for his niece and nephew to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and find healing, peace, and joy and purpose in you. We pray for Kay. Please answer her prayers and have your will to be done in her life. We pray for Alan. Please strengthen the bond between him and his girlfriend. We pray for uh, Bruchena. Please strengthen and guide her in her prayer life. Bless her financially. We pray for Subrat. Please bless and protect them. Please provide them with education and enough money and give them the right kind of house that they need. Please save them and help them to do right, protect them from the coronavirus plague. We pray for Roger. Please give him courage to share his faith, and please bless uh, the work of his hands. And Holy Father God, we pray, uh, Lord, and we, co we uh, commend these souls into your hands. Uh, let your will be done in their lives and in ours. And Holy Father God, we now pray for those who have gotten saved through the preaching of the gospel, through this ministry. We pray for Brian. And we pray for Beatrice. We pray for Imram. And we pray for all of the others who have gotten saved who are not on this short list today. We pray for Jerry. We pray for Des. We pray for Endor. We pray for Linda. We pray for Shema. And we pray for everybody who has gotten saved through this ministry and who has rededicated their life through this ministry. Help them all to grow in the faith and be the Christians that you want them to be. We pray uh, specifically for Mung. We pray for Sam. We pray for Yak. We pray for Cher. We pray for Hip. We pray for Mag. We pray for Bill. We commit these souls into your hands. Let your will be done in their lives and in ours as well. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, our devotional reading today is titled Coming to Jesus by Oswald Chambers. He goes on to say, isn't it humiliating to be told that we must come to Jesus? Think of the things about which we will not come to Jesus Christ. If you want to know how real you are, test yourself by these words, come to me. In every dimension in which you are not real, you will argue or evade the issue altogether. 
rather than come, you will go through sorrow, rather than come, and you will do everything, uh, you will do anything rather than come the last lap of the race and say, just as I am, I come. As long as you have even the least bit of spiritual disrespect, it will always, always reveal itself in the fact that you are expecting God to tell you to do something very big, and yet all he is telling you to do is to come. Come, come to me. When you hear those words, you will know that something must happen in you before you can come. The Holy Spirit will show you what you have to do, and it will involve anything that will uproot whatever is preventing you from getting through to Jesus. And you will never get any further until you are willing to do that very thing. The Holy Spirit will search out that one immovable stronghold within you. But he cannot budge it unless you are willing to let him do so. Come to Jesus. Come to the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help your people to return, in the words of Jonathan Kahn, to you. Help us to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek your face and to turn from our wicked ways and to repent and get back to you our first love as your people. And then for those, Lord, especially who don't know you as Savior, help them to come to you for salvation. Help them to understand your holy salvation as I preach it to them. And Lord, I pray, like Brian the other day, help these to come to know you as Savior. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are with us today, and you are, and you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior in the free pardon of your sins. Allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in Him for your soul's salvation from the power of sin and the punishment of sin in that awful place called hell because hell is real whether you realize it or not first accept the fact dear friend that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law the Holy Bible says in Romans 3:23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. There is a punishment for sin. The Holy Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die physically because of sin. We die physically because of sin. Our bodies go to a grave. Our soul goes to hell if we have never believed in Jesus Christ and repented of our sins in this life. So thirdly, dear friend, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell. And Jesus Christ preached more on hell than anybody in the Bible. 
Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did about heaven. Jesus Christ described hell as a place where the worm, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Jesus Christ described hell as a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in pain. He told the true story about the rich man who went to hell as soon as he died. He lifted up his eyes in hell. This is where you're going if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Jesus Christ was so earnest and so uh, serious about this matter of hell and you're not going to hell. He said these words in Matthew 18, 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off. In other words, if your hand leads you to uh, do evil in God's sight, touch a woman or a man that you're not married to. Your feet lead you to ungodly places and to wrong houses. Cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Also the Bible states in Revelation 21.8 but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. The abominable the abominable include people who they sin beyond the pale, sin beyond what some would say is normal sin. These are the homosexuals, the lesbians, men with men, women with women. These are men and women who lust after little children or underage uh, children. These are they who look at little infants on pornography sites, the abominable. These are they who commit incest. Mothers who wickedly have sex with their sons. Fathers who wickedly have sex with their daughters. This includes stepdaughters, the abominable. Brothers who have sex with their sisters. Sisters who have sex with their brothers incest. That's beyond the pale. This happened the other day, by the way, in the Amish community. Incest. And yes, they should go to jail for raping their sister. And what will happen in jail, as they were told, they would be destroyed for doing such evil. These are they who try to have sex with animals, with dogs and cats and horses. The abominable. You see, you're even disgusted. And you're a sinner too. You're an unbeliever. And whoremongers, whoremongers includes men who are whoremongers, women who are whores, having sex with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, Jane, Betty, and Laura. Whoremongers. 
He said, what will happen to these people? Well, they're going to hell. The people who are not believers, people who are too afraid to get saved because they're worried about political correctness, their family members and friends. I know you feel uncomfortable, but it's, it's high time that you feel uncomfortable again, you wicked, evil adulterers and adulteresses. You liars and you cheats. You whoremongers and you whores. You homosexuals and lesbians and transvestites. <clears throat> trying to turn God's world upside down on his head. These are going to the lake of fire. Yeah, sending them to you. And sorcerers. People who practice witchcraft and voodoo. And idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Uh, somebody needs to tell you where you're going if you don't trust Christ as Savior and repent. You say, well, you're not going to scare me. Uh, scare you where? Scare you to hell number one, hell number two, or hell number three? Scare you where, man? <laughs>